So Eric, we're back in the studio and we're going through our greatest biographies, or at least we're counting down what we have said is some of our greatest biographies. And it is interesting that the one that we're actually talking about today is actually a sequel, if you will, to another book by the same author. Do you want to give a quick overview of just these two books and just uh, the beauty of, of these yeah, stories? It's, it's sort of Don Richardson who wrote Lords of the Earth, which is the one we're talking about. And don't you feel sorry for Peace Child, which is one of our favorite books, but it, it made, well, I, I shouldn't even comment on that because that's in a future episode. Uh, and we shouldn't even say anything. It could, <laughs> it could still be in our countdown. Uh, but two of my all-time favorite books, just right there. But Don Richardson as a writer is, I would just say, one of the greatest writers in the Christian world in my generation. I, he was just amazing. And uh, his passing a couple of years ago, is that mm -hmm. when he passed away? That that hit me deeply because I, I really miss him and I miss his his ability to articulate very difficult things and his ability to diagnose a culture and to be able to look in it and see how God can reach a, a people group. And that was, he was just a first of all, a brilliant man, but then a given man uh, to the purposes of Jesus Christ. And God leveraged his life in a very powerful way, I know, to impact me. Uh, but Peace Child is his own story of going to the Sawi tribe with his wife, Carol. And Lords of the Earth is still sort of an extension of his story, but he's not the main character in it. And we're it, talking Papua New Guinea, I guess, for for those who that would may be not understand the thing. location, but this is mid-1900s yes. Papua New Guinea difficult missions. Difficult missions. These are like tribes, headhunters, uh, cannibals. Uh, even the territory was was uh, life threatening, and you know, just without the people, you know, jagged cliffs, six inch sago thorns, uh, deadly uh, creatures. And uh, there's these missionaries that are going to have a movement in the late 30s, 1930s, all the way through when this book is taking place. This book is going to end right around the beginnings of 1969, and. Uh, it is such a pithy, powerful story that's going to feature a character named Stan Dale or Stanley Dale. Uh, what was it? Last fall, I did a series, 23, 24 part series called Daring to Do with Stanley Dale. And the, the that series isn't just on Stanley Dale. This is one of my reference uh, pieces. But Stanley Dale becomes a symbol in the midst of it, which it plays in big into our discussion now because that is one of the reasons I wrote this. This book had a huge impact on my life, as I know it's had a huge impact on many others. Just the the life, the, the choices that Stanley Dale made are going to be enunciated in and through this book, and it's going to cost him everything. And I don't want to give any spoilers away of where this story leads, but you can sort of guess of what that means when something costs someone everything but how he lays down his life and what happens as a result to the Yali people is so stirring to me, so moving. And so I don't know if that, do you think that's enough of a, an overview? Yeah, I think that's good. I think one thing we just want to at least mention with Lords of the Earth, uh, you don't have to read Peace Child first. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very, uh, it is a standalone book in and yes. of itself. But one of the things we often tell people, or at least our students, is that the first third of the book or so is a little graphic. It's a little intense. Because Richardson's walking through the issues and the problems and the the culture of these tribes, and it is dark. I mean, it is very, uh, it's very evil. It's very perverse it's, at it's times. It's demonic. Yeah. Yes. It's it's what happens in a culture when the light is totally vacated. So yeah. it's it's almost needful to read through it because it makes the story all that all that more powerful. But I know a lot of people have started reading this book and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I was thinking it's like a, a beautiful little missionary yeah. story. What did uh, Eric and Nathan recommend? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think when Philip used to read with our students, he would summarize the first third yeah. and then start reading the book. Yeah. The, like as a family, when we've gone through this book, we've actually skipped uh, with a summary, uh, the, the beginning, and which is sort of sad. And I it think if, if you know the beginning, you understand why Don put it there. Right. However... If you have a family, you understand why you would summarize it because it yep. is, it's, it's pretty heavy stuff as far as the way that people that don't have truth, that don't have life, that don't, that are controlled by uh, demons, how they live. And it is, it's important to create the contrast to recognize how significant, first of all, how challenging it was for, to reach them, but how significant it would be for a group like this right. to give their lives to Jesus and allow Jesus into their culture.
Right. Do you want to address like, what is the impact? I mean, you've already mentioned this book has had a significant impact on your life. Yeah. Do you have some specifics of just how this book has pressed you or uh, influenced yeah, you over the years? The reason I chose Stanley Dale as sort of a picture, uh, poster child, if you will, for my series last fall is because I feel like, and I think this book enunciates it, is it exposes the the weaknesses, the uh, imperfections of Stanley Dale as it goes through it. You like him as you're going through it. It's not like it's it's demeaning him, but it just sort of is an honest take on his rough edges. He was a rather rough-hewn character, uh, a very manly man, yes, but not the easiest guy to deal with if you were a fellow missionary. And yet, it's also portrayed that he is possibly the best puzzle piece that could fit into the need of what the Yali people had at that time in history. And almost it could almost be said, no one else could have possibly fit that puzzle piece spot other than Stanley Dale. In other words, he was uniquely groomed and he had to be hardy. He had to be tough. He had to be uh, rather ornery to be able to fit it. And so the statement would be a very imperfect man is able to be a part of a very perfect work. And that is tremendously encouraging, I think, to anyone who meditates upon that, that it's not our perfection that God needs. It's our yieldedness. It's our willingness to say, yes, God, I don't know why you want to use this imperfect vessel because I'm sort of a mess and, you know, being transformed. He's like, that's all I need. I just need you to be humble. I just need you to be submitted. I just need you to yield and believe and trust that I can do it. And Stanley Dale trusted his God. And what comes out? out of that trusted life, though it be an imperfect life, is absolutely remarkable. Yeah, I totally agree. I think, I think one of the big impacts <clears throat> of the book of a whole, but even just the individual characters, is here they are in a situation that is so hostile to everything that they're coming in to present. Uh, and yet you see their bold confidence and their overwhelming trust. Uh, and you begin to have this idea, and I guess one of the characteristics I just have really loved throughout this book it's just that idea that there is no people or place so severe or so secluded or so difficult that it is not worth everything for the for the sake of Christ. Or, or maybe if I can say it in a different way, there are no people or place that the gospel cannot transform. It's almost yeah. like the Jim Elliott story yeah. in a lot of ways where <clears throat> it, it seems like an impossible situation. How, how on earth are you going to bring a gospel to these kind of people? Yeah. And yet it's through the giving up of life that you, you see this God flip everything and you see the impossible something become possible. Yeah. And you're just like, huh, the, the, the power of the gospel is so uh, efficacious. It's so, uh, it is so powerful in working yeah. and changing a life. And I really love just, and I, I think I, I think because of the first part of the story, the, the darkness and the difficulty, it, it just shines forth that reality that if God can reach those people, yeah. There is no person in my life that God can't reach. You know, I mean, there's, and there's no place that I should be unwilling to go for the sake of the gospel. Yeah. You know, uh, I think maybe in our culture today, it'd be more like probably the Middle East is probably the closest yeah. that I would at least associate with this kind of a culture, not culture, but just the difficulty of yeah. going somewhere. And it's like, okay, am I, uh, am I willing to go to like an Iraq or an Afghanistan or Iran for the sake of the gospel. And it's like, wow, that would be hard. And, and we have friends who are yeah. there and it's just like, and they're like, yes, it's hard. And yet you see the beauty of the gospel and, and the, the worthiness of Christ through these kind of stories Amen. that you see throughout this book. Amen. Let's talk about traits. Cause that's what we're trying to do in each of these books is sort of bring out maybe key impact points for us, but also traits of maybe one of the key characters, the focal character. And this one I'd say Stan Dale is the chief focal character. We have some other characters. Costas yeah. McCreese has, a, I think, had a huge impact on anyone who reads this book. Is like, I like that guy a lot. Uh, Phil, Phil Masters, who who also expends his life and is part of the key crux, uh, pinnacle point of this storyline. Again, another uh, tremendous character. But Don Richardson sort of, you know, zooms in and focuses on the life of Stanley Dale specifically, and so. My takeaway it would be a, a Stanley Dale trait in this, which since I named that series last fall, Daring to Do a Stanley Dale, Daring, uh, is a trait. He is possibly the most daring man, if you could use that as a normal uh, phrase, that I've ever witnessed, ever read about, ever known anything about. He it was just fearless. And some of the situations are so, they make you laugh out loud as you're going through the book 
because you're like, he didn't do that, did he? He did. He did that. And he's facing situations that would cause the rest of us to just crumple into a fearful heap. He, he, he arrives in this valley and he's not welcomed. They don't want him here. And there's this whole band of warriors in their war paint with their bows standing on the other side of a river. And so he sees the challenge at the very beginning. They're trying to intimidate him, but he serves the living God. One man, he walks straight towards them, crosses the river, staring up at them, sort of like with the smile. And it so unnerves this entire warrior troop, this, this, uh, this, this troop of soldiers, uh, warriors, that they literally start running off. And that's how he starts this whole thing. And it's just, it makes you laugh out loud to say, I want to live that way for Jesus, recognizing like Elisha did that greater are those that are with us than those that are with them. The Syrian army is nothing compared to the mountains full of horses and chariots of fire. All around, and Stanley Dale lived with that reality. He might be all by his lonesome in the middle of nowhere in Papua New Guinea, but he knows greater are those that are with him than those that are standing against him. And he proved it in his life in such a beautiful way. So that audacity meets daring, meets boldness, meets courage, all packaged into this character that you just have to smirk and smile at, known as Stanley Dale. You just go, I like that guy. Lord Jesus, stick what that guy had inside of me. I need an upgrade with some of that. It's, it's really amazing. I think it's also a good reminder too that some of the great stories from the Old Testament, the New Testament, they were like, wow, wouldn't it have been amazing to see that? You're actually seeing modern day pictures of that in these kind of stories that I think yeah. is a rich uh, boon for the, for the soul. I think one of my characteristics that I really love, and it's actually a lot of the sub characters, is their willingness not only to come, but even just to serve Stanley Dell in what, what, he is, what he was called to. In other words, you don't get a lot of fanfare in that role number two kind of a, of a position. Mm -hmm. And yet you see several of these guys who are just washing the feet uh, or setting the stage so that God can do and leverage the life of a Stanley Dale. And I think it was just very impactful that, you know, sometimes I think, especially in our culture, we want to be the face of a ministry or we want to be the face of missions or the face of whatever it is. And a lot of times we forget the fact that it's, it's those second, third, fourth, you know, it's the people, you know, cleaning the bathrooms and it's the people who are serving the ministries that actually undergird and help the ministry to even function. And I just think yeah. it's a neat, there's just some neat pictures of that throughout this whole story of just these people who are willing to give up everything to wash the feet of those yeah. who are, who are laboring on behalf of Jesus Christ. I agree. Uh, at the very end of this, there's this plane crash and this family is going to, uh, it, how many was there? Five, it was six people in the plane, five die, one nine-year-old boy survives. And it's a critical pivotal point, not just in this storyline, so I don't want to give much away with it, uh, but also throughout Christian history. I mean, it is a monumental, providential moment where you see a turn, a flip of a storyline, sort of like Haman suddenly being exposed by Esther. It's, it's one of those types of moments where you see God in control at a whole nother level, where a little boy survives, but he's in the middle of the tribe, like right down the hill from where Stan and Phil are killed, uh, just a couple months earlier, and it's a cannibal tribe at the top that hates Christians, white people. I mean, it's like the worst possible situation any mom would ever run into for her child to be in. And that little boy, his name was Paul, uh, reached out to us as a ministry because he was doing research on Stanley Dale because he survived. And now all these years later, this is about 55 years later, he's putting together a book on Stanley Dale. So he's doing research and he saw that I did a whole series. Like this guy has to know something. <laughs> so he's come by our campus twice. And I know some of you have asked how that went because I did a sermon uh, that sort of prepped for that. And it was really fun. Uh, I think it was special for us to just sort of meet Paul. Yeah. He is such a neat, humble man. Yeah. And I, I think, I don't think he values what he went through. Yeah. Like we would value. Yeah. Uh, and even just hearing some of that backstory of just the supernatural providence of God leading that airplane to just happen to crash at that moment in that place yeah. it is a horrible tragedy. And yet, as you were saying, it's, you see the beauty of God and his storyline being woven through the whole thing. Oh, it is. It's a remarkable story. So, uh, but for those of you that have been interested, because I think I gave a sermon called Out of Ash that sort of prepped for that. And it has been a very, very special thing just to sort of see how God preserved him then 
and has preserved him throughout his life. And he has a heart for Jesus Christ. After all these years, though he has been bereft multiple times and gone through tremendous suffering in his life, he has a message. He has a, a, a heart uh, to share Jesus with the nations. He actually went back to Papua New Guinea as an older man to share Jesus as a missionary. So just to see that, just see that redemptive line through the story, even after is pretty special. Well, I know um, that if, if, if they happen to come through again, I know one of our desires is to actually sit him down in the studio and just have a conversation yeah. just so that we can expose just some of that more to our, even our audience. Yeah. Um, but regardless of that, Lords of the Earth is one of those books that really needs to be on your list. Uh, you, This is, I think, another one of those books that you and Leslie read yearly, isn't oh, yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, but we, we think so highly of this book. And if you want to get a copy, we'd encourage you. We'll put a link for this down in the show notes. Anything else you want to say about the book? It's a masterpiece. It is literally one of the greatest things I have ever come near <laughs> as far as a piece of literature. It is remarkable. It is brilliant. It is woven together in such a wonderful way where you can, it, it has such a, a pithy message that just comes through and it changes you. And you just wonder what you're doing with your life. And Lord, here I am, send me. Uh, it's, it's a very, very powerful piece of work. It's true. And if this is ranking number four, you know, what is that going to say about the next three? Yeah, just so, imagine. Uh, you know, well, I'm excited for those next three. Me too. Uh, me too. Well, Eric, thanks so much for the chat and uh, we'll see you guys next time.